I've been asked to talk about what's new drug treatments for IBS. Um, could be a short talk. Um, why do we need new drugs for IBS, I guess, is the first question. So IBS is extremely common. So this is um, an up-to-date meta-analysis from our group showing the prevalence of IBS in the community and the pooled prevalence in these 53 uh, cross-sectional surveys in healthy people, that's important to point out, was 9% using the Rome 3 criteria. So one in 11 people uh, at any one time are reporting symptoms compatible with IBS. With Rome 4, which are more restrictive, it's around about 4 or 5%. Uh, IBS is chronic, so this is research from our group, again, uh, over 10 years, showing that amongst people who report symptoms of IBS at baseline, again, these are healthy people, if you follow them up 10 years later, two-thirds of them have still got IBS. Obviously, IBS triggers consultations with GPs, so these are um, uh, prevalence rates for consulting a GP from various population-based studies, up to 60 to 80% in some studies, and also, for most gastroenterologists, uh, IBS is one of the things that they deal with a lot. So this is the referrals to my uh, general uh, uh, GI clinic for the first three years of my practice. You can see ultimate diagnosis was IBS in one in ten people that I saw that over that time period. Um, I'm now going to talk about drug trials, new trials basically, and I'll go through them in, in sort of stool pattern order. So I'm going to talk first about trials that don't uh, select patients according to stool pattern and then about the trials that uh, recruit according to diarrhea or constipation. So what's new? So this is a trial that some of you will have seen from the Maastricht group, uh, looking at two different um, release profiles of peppermint oil in IBS. So peppermint oil we've previously shown is probably beneficial for people with IBS. Uh, not so much in this study. When they looked at global relief, you can see that actually uh, the ileocolonic release formulation was worse than the placebo, uh, and there was only a very small therapeutic gain of the small intestinal release. Does that alter the bottom line of our meta-analysis? Well, I plugged the trial in here at the bottom of the forest plot, and the answer is no. The relative risk of remaining symptomatic is still reduced with peppermint oil versus a placebo, but the, that new trial certainly widens the, uh, the, the estimate of efficacy in terms of the number needed to treat. You can see that's now could be anywhere between 2 and 73 patients. This is an interesting trial from um, Yori Saito at the Mayo Clinic looking at pregabalin uh, in, uh, in a single center. Uh, so 12 weeks of pregabalin versus a placebo uh, where they used an escalating dose over the first um, 11 weeks and then they tapered it back down again. Most patients female, around about 50% had diarrhea and they looked at various endpoints and you can see that uh, interestingly, uh, pregabalin seemed to be more effective than placebo for pain and for diarrhea, as well as um, for bloating, but not for constipation, and that the overall bowel symptom score was significantly lower with uh, pregabalin. But that didn't seem to translate into a benefit in terms of global relief. The, the global relief symptom uh, rates were uh, pretty similar. So I'm now going to move on and talk about recent trials in IBSD. Uh, so this is an Iranian trial um, looking at metazapine at a dose of 15 to 30 milligrams over eight weeks in people with diarrhea predominant IBS. I don't think many of you will be aware of this trial. I just found it by chance, uh, although it has only just been published. But it's interesting. It uses a, you know, a well-recognized endpoint of a 50-point decrease in the IBS symptom severity score, and uh, metazapine was more effective than placebo. Um, we know that there was a drug in the early 2000s called Alocitron, which is a, a serotonin uh, antagonist, and this was effective in IBS and licensed, but it was withdrawn. This is an interesting study that was published last year, looking at Ondansetron, which we all know is an uh, anti-sickness drug, but also a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. And this is a bimodal formulation, and you can see that this uh, seemed to improve both stool consistency and... Um, abdominal pain, although only stool consistency was statistically significant, and the composite response that the FDA uses to judge efficacy in, in treatment trials wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't superior uh, with ondansetron. But this is promising data. Some of you will know we're doing, we've been doing a trial in the UK called Triton, which is a titrated uh, ondansetron regimen, um, which is closed now. Um, but we are awaiting the results of that trial. It, was, um, it, it didn't recruit quite as it should, partly because of COVID.
Uh, but we'll be releasing the results of that in the next 12 months or so, I think. So this is work from our group, from um, Chris Black and Nick Burr, looking at uh, ranking therapies uh, for IBSD and IBSM. So uh, in a network meta-analysis, and you can see here that um, Elocitron and Ramocitron, which is another 5-HT3 receptor antagonist uh, that's available in Japan, come out top in terms of the FDA composite endpoint ahead of the other licensed treatments in this field, Alexadiline and Rifaximin. And the similar uh, result for abdominal pain, you can see again the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists come out top. And again, for stool frequency. And you can see actually for, for doses of Alexadiline of 75 milligrams and the Rifaximin, there is actually no effect at all on abdominal pain, which is a key uh, symptom. So obviously that, that's interesting, um, but these drugs, most of these drugs aren't available in the UK. So if we plug the Ondansetron trial data in, what we see is actually this seems to be a class effect in terms of the eff efficacy of 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. They're all ranked above Alexadiline and Rifaximine. Um, so I think in the UK, Ondansetron is a, is a good alternative uh, treatment for people with IBSD once they've um, failed sort of anti-diarrheal therapies. It's, it certainly seems to be uh, effective in some people. So just quickly moving on to trials in IBSC now. And um, this is historical, really. I'm just showing you this just to remind you that there's a drug called linaclotide that we do actually have uh, access to in the UK, one of the few drugs. Um, and it is effective in IBS with constipation. So these are the two pivotal phase three trials that show that. The, one of the side effects of linaclotide is diarrhea. So it's around about one in five people will get diarrhea. So the drug company have basically tried to change its release profile in order to try and lessen the uh, side effects, but still give the benefits of um, uh, improvement in stool frequency and uh, abdominal pain. So they formulated these two uh, different releases. One is ileal release and one is ileal sequel release. Uh, some of you will have seen this trial, which has been published this year. It's quite small. There's about 65 people in each arm. Um, and you can see that um, the uh, ileal release formulation seems to still be uh, effective, but not so much the ileal sequel release um, compared with the placebo and compared with the um, conventional uh, linaclotide. There's another drug similar to the linaclotide, which is a secretagogue called placanotide, which has um, been, um, uh, there's been two large phase three trials in the US. Again, it's effective, it's modestly effective. The numbers needed to treat, I've shown you there, are between eight and 14, um, and it's not available in the UK. Maybe it will be coming over here soon, I don't know. And then there's this other drug, which is, again is a secretagogue. It works slightly differently. Um, it's a sodium hydrogen uh, ion exchange inhibitor. And um, again, this is an effective drug, tenapanor, in IBS. We've studied the relative efficacy of all these drugs in IBSC. And with these newer drugs coming out, and we've already got good, quite good experience of using linaclotide, and we know that it doesn't, it's not that well tolerated for some people, and also it's, you know, it is effective in some people, but I don't think it's life-changing. So you're kind of hoping when we do a network meta-analysis like this that these newer drugs are going to um, sort of uh, blow linaclotide out of the water. Unfortunately, not the case. You can see that linaclotide is ranked first uh, in this um, uh, endpoint, the FDA recommended endpoint of an improvement in number of complete spontaneous bowel movements and abdominal pain. And you can see it's got a P-score of 0.91. So that means it's 91% certain that that's the most effective treatment out of all these different drugs. And you can see again, abdominal pain, linaclotide comes out top. And again, for stool frequency. So in terms of the number of complete spontaneous bowel movements, uh, linaclotide again is ranked first. Some of you will remember um, that we have Prucalipride that we use to treat patients with constipation. And in the early 2000s, there was a drug called Tegacerod, which was um, a 5-HT4 receptor agonist like Prucalipride that was licensed, one of the first drugs ever licensed to treat IBS with constipation. But um, there have been no trials of Prucalipride in IBS, and Tegacerod is a drug that's not available. So... This is a new, trial, a new drug, um, a novel 5-HT4 agonist. This is a Japanese trial, a drug called Minesapride. This is a dose-ranging phase two uh, study. 
unfortunately, you can see, you know, there's not much uh, therapeutic signal here and certainly no dose uh, response. There's a slight increase in, uh, in response rate with the uh, 20 milligram dose over the placebo, but that's not statistically significant. What else is on the horizon? So this is um, a drug called Elabixabat, which is a bile acid transporter inhibitor um, that's used for uh, constipation in Japan. And this is a trial from the Lancet Gastro Hep, uh, again, a Japanese trial, only two weeks of treatment, but you can see that uh, Elabixabat was significantly superior to placebo in terms of increasing the number of um, bowel movements. Similarly, this is another drug, misagliflozin. Again, this is a Japanese trial. Again, it's quite short, four weeks of treatment. Um, but again, you can see that the CSBM response is significantly higher with the higher dose of misagliflozin. And both of these trials incorporated some patients who probably met criteria for IBSC within, within the uh, constipation population. So these drugs may well come to uh, phase three trials in IBS. This is a, a, a paper that's a collaboration between um, Professor Sanders, Professor Camilleri, and Professor Walters looking at a drug called Tropifexor in primary bile acid diarrhea and showing that um, ascending colon transit time is, is um, slowed with this drug. So this is a potential treatment for people with IBS with diarrhea or functional diarrhea, I would imagine, uh, extrapolating those results. And then this is just a plug for our own study, which is... Um, the Atlantis study, which is H the HTA-funded trial of um, amitriptyline versus placebo for IBS in primary care, just to show that there are some novel developments awaited. And if this trial uh, completes and recruits to, ta uh, recruits to target, it's certainly not going to recruit to time because of um, COVID, then we may have some uh, alterations in how IBS is managed in primary care if amitriptyline is, uh, is a successful treatment there. So um, I'm just going to conclude now. I've shown you some data from trials of neuromodulator drugs. So I refer to them as neuromodulators rather than antidepressants. I think using the word antidepressants in patients with IBS is stigmatizing. So we talk about central neuromodulators or gut-brain neuromodulators. Uh, so I've shown you pregabalin and um, the trial of metazapine. The Atlantis trial of amitriptyline is awaited. Uh, I've shown you the ondansetron trial data, which I think are potentially important, and I'd encourage you to think about ondansetron uh, in patients with IBS with diarrhea. There's these new secretagogues that are licensed in the USA, still waiting for them to come to Europe. Some of them are three years old now, so I'm not sure that's going to happen. And um, I've shown you the new data for manasapride, which is a 5-HT4 agonist, but I think we need more trials of that drug. And then in terms of future directions, I think the trials that are being conducted in conditions like functional constipation and bile acid diarrhea uh, point out future directions for our patients with IBS in the clinic. So with that, uh, I'll finish and um, thank you for asking me to speak. Thank you, Alex, for that excellent talk. So I've got a question for you. So you've showed us good evidence with different endpoints in the studies for the use of mirtazapine, ondansetron, and pregabalin. So when I see a patient in clinic, is there a stepwise approach on which I should use first? followed by second. And my second part of the question is that, is there any role for combo therapy in patients with really intractable symptoms? That's a very good question. So um, I think um, if some of you will be aware that we've updated the BSG guidelines for the management of IBS, they were 14 years old. And so we provide a uh, kind of a logical stepwise uh, progression through the various treatment options in that uh, in that article as an algorithm, but it, I think you have to split IBS into the sort of pain predominant or mixed stool pattern type, um, the IBS with diarrhea type and the IBS with constipation. And first line treatments for the mixed stool pattern and pain would probably be um, an antispasmodic or peppermint oil or something like that. First line treatment for IBS with diarrhea, probably low pyramide, although you know, we know it's not a great drug and um, it's, it, there's no real clinical trial evidence. And first line treatments for constipation um, would be um, uh, fiber gel or laxatives. Obviously, this is assuming that they've already tried dietary lifestyle advice, exercise, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and maybe a probiotic. And then second line treatment, we'd go down the route of, you know, for pain, predominantly talking about a neuromodulator. Um, for diarrhea, then where pain isn't so much of a problem, uh, I would say you should be using a drug like ondansetron. 
uh, if it's both diarrhea and pain, then I think it, there's evidence um, that amitriptyline slows GI transit and modulates pain, so I would use amitriptyline there. This is secondary care, obviously. Uh, and then for constipation, then we're talking about a secretagog, really. And then beyond that, obviously, psychological therapies, um, and you know, which you could argue should be being used earlier in the treatment course. Um, to go back to your other point, um, are there any trials of combination therapy? No, uh, there aren't, but it's something that people like Doug Drossman think can be beneficial. So you can use, um, for instance, you know, a tricyclic with an SSRI. It's safe to do that, um, particularly if there's a lot of anxiety about toilet like that, then an SSRI can be helpful. Uh, you've got to be careful, though. You can't use certain drugs together. So you shouldn't use an SSRI with an SNRI, for instance, because there's a risk of serotonin syndrome. I think most of us as gastroenterologists feel quite uncomfortable with that, kind of, you know, juggling various drugs that are all considered to be psychotropic medications. Um, so I think you need sort of specialist advice in, in, that, in that area. You need to tread carefully.